Mr Scargill. Um, I'm glad you were able to, to make it. I know we had a wee bit of difficulty uh, with Wednesday mornings, but I'm pleased you've been able to come this afternoon. We've got your evidence. Um, perhaps we could just start off, since you're answering on your own, you don't have to introduce any of your colleagues. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps share with us some of your thoughts on the future, as you see it, of the British deep mine coal industry and whether you think the government is doing enough at this stage to assist the industry. Um, if we could maybe start off there and if you could give us some of your views. Well, Mr Chairman, can I first of all say that the British deep mine coal industry is threatened, in my view, with extinction. And yet the reasons are not based on reserves, environment or economics. Coal reserves, for example, in Britain will last for over 1,000 years, whilst reserves of gas, at least on present estimates, will exhaust in 16 years, oil in 25 years, and so there can be no argument as far as reserves are concerned. There are those, of course, who suggest that the real reason for the alternative energy strategy is the desire to keep Britain's commitment to the environment. I suggest that that's a statement which is patently untrue. At a time when British deep mine coals are being threatened with closure, 36 million tonnes of inferior quality coal is either being imported or produced by environmentally unacceptable open cast mining. It's therefore clear that the threat to pits is not as a result of any environment considerations. Economics? In terms of the economics of the industry, and I refer the select committee to previous statements that I've made both in 1992 and 1982, there can be no doubt that nuclear energy, which produces electricity, is 450% more expensive than British coal, provided one compares like with like. And uh, it certainly is a, a billion pounds cheaper than subsidised imported coal. There can be no doubt in my view that the reason for closure is not economic. And therefore, there must be a reason which is beyond either environmental, reserves or economics. And I submit to this committee that that reason is political. I submit that the new Labour government has betrayed Britain's miners, mining communities, by allowing the free market policy to operate a policy that will result in the destruction of the British deep mine coal industry. The government's insistence that British deep mine coal must compete in an open market is a statement that ministers must know to be untrue, because British deep mine coal is having to compete in a market artificially rigged in favour of deep mines coal competitors. For example, if one looks at the nuclear power industry, no amount of statistical juggling can hide the fact that the real costs of nuclear power generated electricity is in excess of eight pence per kilowatt hour. If we were operating in a truly free market, the nuclear industry could not survive, and certainly the Magnox stations, now operating well beyond their planned decommissioning date, would all be closed. That in itself would create an immediate market of 9 million tonnes for British coal. A statement, incidentally, I made to the Select Committee in 1992. In 1989, the Labour Party's then Shadow Energy Secretary, addressing the NUM's annual conference, said that the Thatcher government's, quote, concern for the environment is just another device to boost the case for nuclear power, unquote, and that the nuclear industry had deliberately excluded being excluded from the energy marketplace. It was, he said, quotes, ring-fenced, unquote, and guaranteed a 20% share of the power-generating market. This despite the fact that it was 450% more expensive than British deep mine coal. He said, quotes, fair competition with the nuclear industry is all that the coal industry needs, unquote. Tony Blair was the shadow energy spokesperson at the time, and his statement was true then. I'm afraid that the words ring rather hollow with the mining communities today. 
if all the nuclear industry's costs, including capital safety and decommissioning costs, are taken into account, then Britain's deep mine coal has in our submission a price advantage probably approaching 500% better than dangerous expensive nuclear energy. The dash for gas, with great respect to everybody in this committee, has become under New Labour a gallop for gas, despite the fact that known recoverable reserves are no more than 16 years, compared with over 1,000 years for the British deep mine coal industry. In support of my statement, I refer you to Tony Blair in various statements and also to Tony Benn, who was the longest serving energy secretary and who made it absolutely clear that Britain had over 1,000 years of coal reserves. But also Robin Cook in a speech in the House of Commons in March 1993 said, quote, it is daft to put gas through power stations to turn it into electricity for base load. The most sensible thing is to pump it directly to heat homes and factories. The most wasteful thing to do is to put it in through a power station first, because that way one loses half the heat, end quote. Electricity produced at a conventional coal-fired power station is cheaper than electricity produced by a new gas-fired power station. The NUM estimate that if a conventional coal station is fitted with clean coal technology, it will have a price advantage over any gas-fired power station of at least some 0.5 pence per kilowatt hour. And I refer you to pages 52 and 53 of the Trade and Industries Report in 1993. It's essential that Britain's deep mine coal industry is allowed to generate electricity on the basis of base load and not on peak time arrangements. If we compare like with like, and British coal is allowed to produce electricity on continuous base load, it is undoubtedly cheaper than gas. I find the government's decision to approve five new gas-fired power stations disgusting, and a complete betrayal of every undertaking given, not only to Britain's miners, but also to the British people. We are asking this Trade and Industry Committee to recommend a complete reversal in respect of gas-fired power stations. There's no reason, as we explained to Mr. Battle, why retrospective legislation should not be introduced immediately. If the Conservative government could retrospectively introduce policies which ditched the Labour government's 1974 plan for coal and with it closed 170 pits, then I can see no reason why the new Labour government should not reverse that policy and protect what is left of Britain's deep mine coal industry. I turn very briefly to the question of open cast mining. Uh, Mr. Scargill, I don't want to interrupt you, but we, we have got uh, a number of headings that we want to raise with you, and perhaps we could maybe pick them up. I think this might be a useful point. You've given us a good introduction. We want to raise open cast. We want to raise imports. We want to raise mothballing and reopening of pits, workers' benefits, and alternative markets to coal. So perhaps if we were to do it by way of question and answer, uh, Three points, and I okay, agree with that. Fine, that might be helpful. One, we're calling for a ban on open cast mining mm -hmm. because it produces 16 million tonnes of coal um, and it's environmentally unacceptable, both at the source where it's produced as well uh, as a, a, in a power station, if one argues that. Secondly, coal imports, we're arguing for a complete ban and believe the previous Trade and Industry Select Committee supported that view. We're asking that. Um, Above all, the coal industry should be taken back into public ownership. And in particular, we would refer you to the promises and undertakings given by both uh, Mr. Blair, by the late John Smith, by Neil Kinnock, and by a whole range of Labour ministers, including Robin Cook and uh, Mr. Blunkett, and a wide range of spokespeople uh, for the party. So by all means, I'm prepared to answer questions, and uh, I'd be interested in what they are. Well, thanks very much. That was a helpful resume, which in some ways uh, expanded on some of the points you made in your uh, written statement to us. But perhaps we could, before we go any further, um, you've claimed credit in the past for identifying the direction, the downward direction, sadly, that the British coal industry has, uh, was going to go. Um, on the basis of your 
past forecasting record. Uh, what scale of pit closures and job losses do you expect in the new year? Now, I ask you this not as a trick question because I, I'm not sure if you're aware that there has been apparently an agreement entered into between the three uh, generators and Budge uh, to uh, carry on the contracts until the end of June this year, uh, so that the contracts are being extended for another three months. I don't know if you were aware of that. It was announced by the Prime Minister during the Prime Minister's questions this afternoon. But, um, I mean, notwithstanding that, uh, how do you see it? Let's say, if you were coming before us 12 months today, what sort of coal industry do you think would exist in, in the United Kingdom? Well, my answer will not be a trick answer either. Um, I regard the statement today by the Prime Minister as being one in very similar terms to that of Michael Heseltine in 1992, which merely announced a moratorium for a limited period. In other words, it's a stay of execution. It only lasts for 12 weeks. And what's required for this industry is long-term security. The previous trade uh, um, committee uh, said very clearly in 1993 when it published its report that the British coal industry, I'm talking about the deep mine coal industry, would have a long and secure future. And I criticised the report at the time. The answer to your question is that it all depends on government policy. I am not calling for a subsidy for Mr Budge. I am calling for measures which, in my view, are sensible and straightforward environmentally acceptable, economically acceptable, and certainly based upon common sense. First of all, ignoring all of the factors, a complete ban on open cast coal mining, which scars the countryside and contaminates the atmosphere at the source of production, would give us 16 million tonnes for Britain's deep uh, mine coal industry. Secondly... Just on that point, could you just tell me... Uh, what about those open cast schemes which are going to renew areas which have been despoiled and scarred by, by former mining activities, where there is a case for clearing up the, uh, the rubble and the, the, co the, the coal bings, as we call them in Scotland? Uh, do you think that that, should, that that work should result in coal being made available for sale, or do you think you should just get rid of it? I mean, well, you may be more in tune with uh, the areas uh, that you describe than I am, but it's been my experience that what's happened when they've closed down a, a mine, certainly since 1985, that they've been in, so intent on destroying all evidence that coal mining existed that they've actually planted grass over the top of where the mine was. They've removed the mine shaft, they've filled it in, and there's no evidence in most areas that there was any coal mining at all. I could give you a number of examples where, having done that, they then apply for permission to have open cast mining on the very site where they previously had a good, effective, deep mine. Take Grimethorpe, for example, a reasonably good example, where the film Brassed Off uh, was made. And I can tell you the miners of Britain are pretty brassed off at the present time. If that area, were allowed uh, to continue developing open cast mining, then uh, most people would be as sick as a parrot. But you have neighbor, in the neighboring pit, a pit called Houghton Main, a closure where the whole area was grassed over. And suddenly they were allowed to develop it in a, in, as an open cast site. Now quite frankly, that in my view, cannot be acceptable to close down a deep mine and then suddenly rape the countryside, contaminate the area, contaminate the environment, and still produce coal. If we were in, re in need of coal in the first place, then the pit, which was profitable, should have been kept open. Yes, I mean, uh, you'll be aware from reading uh, our previous reports that many of us who served on this committee for some years uh, have some sympathy with your case. Um, on the other hand, I think, uh, we are faced with a dilemma, uh, namely that when we have seen the electricity uh, generators uh, only last week, um, they claim to us that the cost of generating with coal is significantly higher than the cost of generating with coal. Why would they be saying that to us if, 
your assertion that it's untrue is a fact? I suppose the stock answer would be you have to ask them and not me, but with respect, they're not telling the truth. Can I tell you what the former chairman of this committee said? That's Mr. Caborn. He said, we have proved beyond any doubt that the cheapest way to produce electricity in the United Kingdom is coal-powered generators. Now, if <laughs> that statement is either true or untrue, so if you're saying my statement's untrue, then you're also saying your previous chairman of this committee is untrue. I'm saying that that was his opinion, but... but, but well, I'm sorry, uh, he was speaking on behalf of this committee. Well, he was, but ca can I just come back to the fact that we are now being told by the generators, who are businessmen, after all, they're in business to make a profit, and presumably that if they felt that coal was cheaper, if they genuinely believed that, they could make more profit burning coal than they could burning gas or other fuels. So why are they resisting coal, in your opinion? Resisting coal because of privatisation of the electricity generating industry. And because of the way in which it was done, they are not allowed to simply pass on any increases they would like to the consumer. Um, one of the ways that they can get round that is by developing new gas-fired power stations. We told the uh, Select Committee this in 1992 when we gave evidence, both in written form and orally, and there can be little doubt that if you examine the evidence in the previous Select Committee's own report, it's here. They said at the time, without any question, that coal-generated electricity is the cheapest form of generating electricity. Well, I'm a member of that committee, and I remember the evidence that we had at the time, but I come back to the fact that these guys are businessmen, and they seem to think that they're better off burning gas than coal. I mean, they, they said that quite clearly to us last week. Uh, and you know, if they're in it to make... I mean, I think there are other factors which perhaps we might explore, like the fact that coal isn't burnt at base load, for example, and, you know, the operation of the pool discriminates against coal. But uh, why should the generators themselves discriminate? Well, I've given you an answer, and I, th I, I suspect that in, if this were a court of law, my evidence would carry tremendous weight. I'm actually quoting this committee's own conclusion. And you concluded that the cheapest way to produce electricity was by coal. And it's also a fact that if it was operated on a baseload arrangement rather than on peak time, then it would be infinitely uh, less expensive than gas and certainly less expensive than nuclear energy. If I can pose the question rhetorically back to you, why is it that they're still arguing for energy, that's electricity, produced from nuclear power when it's obvious to anybody that it's about 8 pence per kilowatt hour compared with about 1.6 pence per kilowatt hour for coal. Well, the answer to that question is that that isn't the facts that have been delivered to us. Of course, if you were to build a new nuclear power station, it would be absolutely true that the costs might be something approaching what you suggested. But the fact is that these stations are built, the public investment's been made, and we're talking about the marginal cost of producing in those stations, given that they're already there and in existence. And that's why they are cheaper than coal. We, we, we said that in our report, uh, that to run them on until the end of their possible life uh, uh, was a viable option. Well, I'm sorry, with respect, you didn't say that in your report. You came to the conclusion that um, the nuclear industry uh, had had £10 billion pounds 10 billion in the form of a subsidy that if you'd have given the same subsidy to coal, we could have uh, produced our coal, given it away to the generators and given them 70 pounds to take it. But that subsidy's already been paid, so we're talking about well, what's in the economic interest of Britain at the moment. And surely it's in the economic interest of Britain at the moment to use the stations that have already been subsidised, not to scrap them. Well, with respect, that's a completely uh, silly argument. If you're saying well, all the money's already been spent and therefore we can't take it into account, then you're <coughs> twisting economics. The fact is that if you are going to compare like with like, you've got to look at what money has been spent both in the coal industry, has been spent in the nuclear industry, and look at the decommissioning costs as well as the actual generating costs. And if you take them all into account, I suggest to you that the actual cost of generating electricity from nuclear power is 8 pence per kilowatt hour, from coal, it's 1.6. I suggest that there can be no doubt that it's about uh, 2.6 pence for gas. 
uh, because <laughs> totally with the evidence that's been given to us. Well, could I just say this, because I think it's an important point. Again, and I take uh, no satisfaction for saying I told you so, but since 1982, the evidence I've given to this committee has been proved correct. The arguments that you're putting forward now, which have been put forward before, have been proved incorrect. And the evidence is here in the book that you published in 1993. Mr. Baldry. Um, I think uh, most of those who have come before us are agreed that uh, the coal industry faces a bleak future and that the number of people likely to be employed in the industry after the first of April next year, now maybe June after next year, uh, are likely to be substantially reduced unless something happens. Uh, the difficulty, it seems, is that all those who come before us have a different suggestion as to what should happen. Uh, the UDM have asked for a, a subsidy for, for coal. Uh, Mr. Budge doesn't he, he said he didn't want a subsidy. He said he'd only apply for a subsidy because he'd read in the newspapers that he had, so he thought he might as well, just in case there was one. Um, but he uh, believed that if he could secure contracts with Spain and Germany, he could export sufficient coal to keep the pits going to existing levels. And, and you, uh, Mr. Scargill, have given us a, a long list of, of things that you would like. Can I just ask you about coal exports? I mean, the NUM must have some reasonable intelligence about markets overseas. I mean, what, what do you think are the possibilities of actually the UK exporting coal to countries like Spain? Is that a realistic proposition, or is that just pie in the sky? Well, I've no idea, quite frankly. The fact that we've got 36 million tonnes of coal being produced in Britain from open cast sites, and uh, a recommendation in 1993 from this committee that they should be run down, the fact that we've got coal imports running at an average of about 20 million tonnes, and again, a, re a recommendation from the committee in 1993 that that should be reduced, uh, is in itself sufficient, if that was done, to pr protect every single deep coal mine in Britain. But, of course, Mr Budge doesn't talk to me, um, and in any event, I would take the industry off Mr Budge and the others and give it back. Uh, to the British people. I would, in fact, take it back into public ownership. It should never have been given. You may be interested to know that he's actually made more money in the four years that he's had it uh, than he paid for it. Within the politics of the possible, you, you know that the chances of this government uh, re-nationalising the coal industry are non-existent, so it's a, it's a pointless issue to pursue, isn't it? Why? <laughs> because because we're all, uh, uh, I think in this room, fairly uh, grown-up politicians, and we just know that's not going to happen. In other words, you think that if people are allowed just to simply change their minds, then I should accept it. Well, I'm sorry, I don't take that view. Well, well, I take the view, you see, that if uh, leaders of the Labour Party, like Mr Kinnock, the late John Smith, uh, are prepared to give me undertakings, uh, and my colleagues' undertakings, that in the event of the coal industry being privatised, if and when the uh, Labour government uh, came to power, it would uh, take back into public ownership the deep mine coal industry. I would have thought that that was a commitment that would be honoured. Look, look, I mean, you've got a very good illustration today of you know, the, the, the position so far as the Labour Party and the NUM are concerned. I mean, this committee, apart from the chairman, only one Labour member of this committee has turned up to hear you give evidence. Uh, you know, the idea that the Labour Party is going to be listening to the NUM or Arthur Scargill on these issues is pie in the sky, isn't it? I mean, New Labour has, is, you know, on to a completely different agenda. Well, that's a matter that you'll have to take up with New Labour. I'm here to give evidence <laughs> well, about the coal mining industry. Yes. You've asked me what the solutions are. I've told you what the solutions are. Uh, in addition to the ones that I've already indicated, uh, you talk about uh, exporting coal. Well, before we do that, I would stop importing French nuclear generated electricity. I would cut the, new, uh, the uh, in interconnector, and that would give us another uh, six and a half uh, million tons of coal per year for the British coal industry. Any one of those uh, suggestions on its own would keep open every single deep mine that's currently open today. The whole of them together would result in an expanding industry. Bearing in mind we've got a thousand years of coal reserves 
and only 16 years of known reserves of gas. And nobody seems to be addressing that point. Mr. Scow, can I just... You were asked a question there about, the imp, about exporting coal, and you've referred to imports of coal by wire. Now, in the intervening period since 1993, there have been changes in the international price of coal. And there are some coals from abroad which would appear to be cheaper than the coal which, uh, you, uh, uh, which, which your members uh, can extract. Not all of them, but some of them. Now, for example, my understanding is that low sulphur coal, which would assist the industry uh, or the, the, the generating industry at least, in meeting its environmental targets, uh, that the price of imported low sulphur coal can be delivered to inland UK power stations at the price of 110 to 115 pence per gigajoule. Now, my understanding is that that is cheaper than, uh, the, than Budge can do for the, the generators at the present moment. Now, if you were a generator, and you had to choose uh, your, your supplier, would you choose a UK one which is expensive or a foreign one which it was cheaper? If you were in the position of a, a customer for coal who is generating uh, energy within the UK? Well, I'm not, and I'm not in the habit of answering what I call loaded questions. You see, the hypothetical question. Well, I it's, not, think a, it's, it's loaded, not a hypothetical it? question. It's a question that's got a lot of merit and deserves an answer. One of the things I would say to you is that it really does take the proverbial biscuit to point out to me that you can get low sulphur coals cheaper from abroad than in Britain after the Tory government closed down the cheapest low sulphur mines in the world, particularly in Kent, in Wales, and in the Northeast. And therefore, it's not a hypothetical answer. But let me just give you a quote, can I? Margaret Beckett, who is the president of the Board of Trade, has said, uh, that um, British coal is efficient and cost effective and it's being kept out of the markets by heavily subsidised high cost producers who are distorting the marketplace. Now that's a fact both for foreign coal as well as coal as well as uh, uh, electricity generated by any other means in Britain. You see the fact is that if you look at the evidence you find that the coal that's coming from abroad in every single case that I've examined is actually subsidised. Australia. Australian coal, absolutely. In Australia, I can tell you the position. It took hours of um, determined questioning to get the answers. But I went over to Australia. They are given from the state government 150% in return for every Australian dollar they spend on research and development. And secondly, they are given three Australian dollars by way of a subsidy to transport the coal from pit to port. Now, if the British mining industry were given that, we could outperform the Australian coal industry by miles. If you want to take the American industry, the American coal industry is given $700 million a year in subsidies. And don't start quoting to me the Colombian coal industry where they employ seven-year-old children. If you want to compare like with like, fine. But even if you want to compare that one, it still is subsidised both by the producer and the government. To imposing coal in principle, it's just where it's subsidised and you're not, is that? No, I mean, I'm opposed to closing down Britain's deep coal industry, deep mine coal industry, and importing coal uh, from abroad. It seems to me to be the economics of uh, uh, the madhouse. Let me remind you that I was warning against the policy in the 1970s of relying on what was described, to use Mr. Baldry's uh, arguments, uh, uh, as cheap fuel. Um, for instance, we were bringing in what was then described as cheap oil. The oil price, over which we had no control, quadrupled overnight. And suddenly, the plan for coal in 1974 had to be introduced. And therefore, I am not in favour of relying upon imported fuels over which we've got no control and which could be increased in price literally within an hour. I am in favour of an expanding and developing British coal industry with no more pit closures. Would it be fair to say that that's a strategic argument then? Because obviously anybody who produces anything could say, let's not import the competitor product because it will keep my market here. I would have thought it so was a sensible coal? and a tactical argument that if you produce, whether it be coal or steel or cotton 
or any other thing in Britain, then you ought to be developing your own products rather than relying on some other products from abroad, particularly from areas which are unstable. Let me give you a good example with gas. If we run out of gas, as has been predicted, within about 16 years, we're going to have to rely on gas from Russia and the former republics of what was then the Soviet Union. And anything could happen, and there's no doubt that the price of gas would escalate beyond all reason. Um, so there could be no argument that we shouldn't be doing that. In terms of coal, is there anybody uh, thinks for one moment that uh, we should not be saying, if we import coal and close down our own mines, then they've got a captive market. And that means they could put the price up whenever they wish. And here we are, members of the European Union, which I don't agree with, by the way, but nevertheless, we happen to have in Britain today enough coal to supply the whole of what was the European common market for the next 230 years. I reckon it's the policy, uh, the policy of, of, of the madhouse uh, to be dependent upon foreign fuel. Right. Can I, I, I just, uh, you, you, so you, you, would you, you would be in favour um, of selling British coal into Europe, would you? Of course I would. Right. I, we, we, we're, we're, on, we're in agreement on, on that point. Can I just clear up another point that, I, that um, I'm not too certain about here? One of the problems, as I understand it, of the coal industry um, is that once a colliery is closed, two things will happen. The processes of plugging the, the shaft by concrete or whatever will take place. And it becomes exceedingly difficult then to reopen the mine and that in the period after closure, there are various things that will happen underground, geologically, that will not necessarily make the uh, reserves as accessible as once they were. And that, therefore, adds to the cost of, uh, of, of getting the coal. Uh, how would you get around that problem, uh, assuming that, uh, for the purposes of the moment, we are not going to have public ownership? And can I just say in passing, I was present at meetings with you when the question of renationalisation was considered. And the questions of renationalisation at these meetings with John Smith, with David Blunkett, uh, not with Neil Kinnock, I have to say, but certainly with the last two, and with Robin Cook. And there was never any undertakings given to you that there would be a renationalisation of the coal industry on the return of a Labour government. There were a number of qualifications given at that time, and these qualifications have never yet been brought into play. So for the purposes of today, I think the questions that we'll be asking you are on the assumption that for the foreseeable future at least, the coal industry in Britain will remain in private hands. So we come to the point that it's expensive to reopen coal mines, to meet the kind of targets of output that you would like to see given the power stations that are available for consuming coal. Uh, how do you think that can be done financially? I'm sorry, it's a long question, but um, how, how do you think this can be done in, a, 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 in, in a, a, a private market for coal, for energy generation, and ultimately for the public buying uh, the electricity that's provided? Well, you wouldn't expect me to answer the question without commenting on what you just said. It may be that your recollection of the meetings that we had is different from mine and those of our note takers. All I would say is that it's our firm recollection that commitments were given that on the election of a Labour government, the coal industry, if it was privatised, would be taken back into public ownership. We're going to I have would, to dis agree to uh, disagree. Well, all right. I would, I would simply say, in support of that, it was also Labour Party conference policy. On the question that you ask about the development, or the reopening of a, a mine that's already closed, or even the development of a new mine? The answer is relatively simple, because we've got the experience. You can develop a new mine within the period of about 18 months if it's a drift mine. In other words, if it's not a shaft. Prince of Wales in West Yorkshire is a very good example. That mine was developed within 18 months. Riddings Drift in South Yorkshire was actually developed in just over a year and produced very good quality coal at a, a very good profit. 
there is already a mine uh, which is open but not producing coal in a place called Thorn near Doncaster. It's a coal mine that we consider is capable of producing about 3 million tons of coal a year. And yet that mine has been ready for production for a number of years and still isn't producing. So in other words, there is capacity that one could look at within uh, a period no longer in the case of Thorn than about six months. In the case of uh, new mines or redevelopment of mines, uh, they could be reopened by using uh, the technique known as drift mining within uh, about 18 months. Because we've got the experience at Hemsworth where Ridden's Drift was driven, at the Prince of Wales Colliery, which was a, a deep mine, and uh, decided to develop a drift mine um, uh, to get the access to the coal reserves that were there. So we've got a wealth of experience which was promoted under the, the Labour government's plan for coal in 1974 that can demonstrate how quickly it can be done. You do not necessarily lose the coal reserves if you close a mine. Uh, what you do do is you have a lead-in time, obviously, but the lead-in time for developing those coal reserves would be no more, in my view, than about 18 months. Can I just ask you one last question? We have reserves, we have a means of accessing them. The one other element is labour. Um, how <coughs> confident are you that unemployed or employed former miners would be willing to go back down underground again? I think that with the huge number of people who are unemployed, there is a reservoir of uh, labour ready, willing and able to be employed in the British mining industry. I would, however, say that they want some guarantees. They're sick and tired of being betrayed by various <coughs> governments. They've been promised time and time again, a strong, developing, efficient, deep mine coal industry. In the plan for coal, Britain's miners met every criteria laid down. Their reward was the most savage butchery that the coal industry, and probably any industry, has ever had to endure, certainly in the last uh, 75 years. And so I don't see any problem about mine workers either being re-employed or young people who are unemployed being trained as mine workers, provided they know that they're going to go into an industry that's got a future, that can supply not only the electricity needs of Britain, but also the other energy needs of Britain. And I would also make one final point. I find it absolutely astonishing that some of the power generators in Britain who are wanting to use alternative sources of energy, and uh, as a result, threatening the closure of pits, are actually developing coal-fired power stations abroad to use foreign coal. That's blatant hypocrisy. Mr. 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 Let me just perhaps position myself uh, and say that we are where we are at the present time, and the reason for uh, the Select Committee having a look at this is to, it seems to me, very much to try and address some of the short-term issues, because the crucial issue, of course, was the inability it appeared at, at, at uh, perhaps a, a couple of months ago of RJB mining to be able to negotiate and bring to a satisfactory conclusion contracts uh, with the power generators. Um, but I'd, I want first off to have a look at some of the issues that, that, that you referred to, and one of them is, is particularly uh, not just the issue on, on open casting. Although I just want to ask you a quick question on that, because you've said that the uh, level of, uh, of extraction of coal uh, from open casting is 36 million tonnes uh, per annum. Uh, but the figure that uh, I certainly have uh, and that has been provided to us is somewhere about half of that, about 19 million tonnes per annum uh, of, of coal that's extracted as a result of uh, open casting activities. So there's a difference there. And could I just ask you where you obtained your figures from? I didn't give you those figures with respect. What I said was that we're importing something like 20 million tonnes of coal and we're producing by open cast mining some 16 million tonnes of coal and if you add the two together I think it comes to 36 million tonnes. I said those two measures alone if we stopped open cast mining and we stopped coal imports would provide a market for British deep mine coal of 36 million tonnes. That's what I said. Perhaps my misunderstanding but I, I, I thought you said that, that, that it was 36 million tonnes. Okay that's, that, that's cleared that and thank you. 
One of the other issues that you've raised, or a number of issues you've raised in your, uh, in your submission to, uh, to this select committee, uh, is, is, I suppose, grouped together under what I would term the environmental impact, perhaps, of, of increased use of coal. Because on page 11 of your document, uh, you've advocated the closing down of uh, Magnox nuclear power stations. Have you done any research in terms of what your perception is, or accurate information, as to regard the cost of that and the environmental impact of undertaking that work? Have you done any research or activity on that? And if you have, could you let us have the figures? Yes. Um, in my view, and in the view of the NUM, there can be no doubt that uh, all nuclear power stations, whether they be Magnox or the AGR stations, will have at some stage uh, to close. Uh, that, that's a fact of life. And therefore, the decommissioning costs will have to be taken on board. It's also a fact, as was previously referred to in the Trade and Industry Select Committee report in 1993, that the Magnox stations were running beyond uh, the date when they were supposed to be decommissioned, which was the mid-1990s. Although the evidence to that select committee suggested that by various means, their life could be extended from 30 uh, to 40 years. The best will in the world, if that statement is right, and I see no evidence to the contrary, you are going to face the decommissioning costs in economic terms and environmental terms uh, within the next four to five years in any event. That's on the basis of what the report said and was accepted by Parliament. That will be an horrendous cost. Whoever's going to pick up the bill, I don't know. I suspect it will be the British taxpayer, the way things are going on. Our view is that there can be no argument that the cheapest way of producing electricity, if you compare nuclear and coal, and certainly if you compare the Magnox stations, which should have been closed already, is by producing electricity from coal. Now, the costs to which you refer, and I understand the question perfectly, and the environmental considerations to which you refer, and I again understand that, will be there in the three year or four year period ahead when they will have to close, even if they do go to 40 years instead of 30 years, which now appears likely. Yeah, fine. Can I move on and can I refer you to page, page 13 of your uh, report? I just want to check this out because it, uh, it's a direct quote from the report. It says, in fact, all, and I use the word, all evidence demonstrates that Britain does not need gas-fired power stations. And then goes on to say the new Labour government should be calling for gas-fired power stations to be closed and replaced with clean coal-fired stations. I, I think this raises probably in my mind a couple of questions. When you say all the evidence, could you expand upon what all the evidence uh, uh, means? And in terms of who researched that and where it was and where it was commissioned from, when you say all of the evidence points that you know, we do not need gas-fired power stations? Certainly. It was actually uh, this committee. You produced the evidence. It's in a report in 1993. And uh, you... Sorry? Before my time. Ah, absolutely, and I forgive you for that. But there can be no doubt that the <laughs> committee came to the conclusion, and the chairman, sorry, the former chairman of the committee said, and again I, I, I quote, he, he, he said the problem of the energy industry is that it operates in a rigged market. And that is the problem. And he said we have proved beyond any doubt that the cheapest way to produce electricity in the United Kingdom is coal-powered generators, unquote. I can't have better evidence than... Uh, the former chairman of the Trade and Industry Select Committee speaking on behalf of the committee. If you and I were shareholders of one of the generators, I'm not, I'm not sure if you are, but I would imagine you're not, um, but you're, you, may, you may have trustees of pension funds who are, and um, they could quite legitimately go to court and say, why on earth is all this electricity being generated from gas if coal is cheaper. Now, a number of these city uh, investors who do this kind of thing, uh, would, according to you, would have a very strong case. Uh, they could go to court, they could take the directors of National Power or Power Gen and say, why are you not burning British coal rather than North Sea gas? Could you suggest to me any reason why they're not doing that and why under the Companies Act these directors are getting away with this dereliction of duty if they're not doing what uh, 
uh, you say they should be, namely burning coal in sufficient quantities? Well, there can be no doubt that it's, uh, it's a, a question that's actually answered in the, and I again refer and make no apology for doing so, to the 1993 Select Committee report, where it answered that, that question. And it's because of privatization. Uh, as a result of privatization, uh, the way in which they get round being able to um, uh, pass on uh, an increased cost to the uh, consumer is by developing their own uh, gas-fired power stations. But the trade and industry select... For example, it's cheaper to produce electricity no, no. by using their own gas-fired power stations no. than to burn coal in the old... I mean, the, the, before you go back to that, can I just say that that document could be dated in the sense that prices both rise and fall over a period of time. It could be that gas is now cheaper than coal was. For example, I mean, would you accept that that's a possible case? No, I don't accept it. I, I, I would argue with you uh, to the contrary. I would say that when this document was, uh, in fact, produced, it was accepted in the document, and I can, if you wish, refer you to the, the actual costs. It was 1.9 pence per kilowatt hour, compared with a, a range of between 2.4 and 2.9 pence per kilowatt hour for gas. Uh, in fact, the the difference in favour of coal has become more apparent because it's now 1.6 pence per kilowatt hour. And I would have thought that they, there should be no difficulty in getting that evidence from either the generators uh, or indeed the suppliers. One of the problems you see is that you have to take into account uh, a question that was raised previously about base load. If you generate um, on base load with gas, and it has to be done that way, otherwise it's uneconomic, even on their terms, um, then you're always going to have a position where they're able to argue that it's a, it's a better proposition uh, than coal, or appears to be so. The reality is that the fair comparison to be made is, what are the comparative costs to generate electricity on base load using coal produced by deep mining and using gas. And if you use that comparison, then we submit that coal is infinitely cheaper. And you would, you would then advise the shareholders of National Power, PowerGen and Eastern Electricity to take their boards of directors to court because they're not maximizing profit, which is, as I understand it, the responsibility of directors under a, a system of private ownership. Would that be correct? No, you'd be wrong. I would be advising the Labour government to take it back into public ownership. But, you, you, but I mean, you, you, you recognise that there is a case that could be made out for shareholders to do that. That, that would be a not unreasonable conclusion to draw from the evidence you're giving. You may say that. I wouldn't possibly comment. All I would say is that I would be recommending, and I'm recommending on behalf of the NUM, the Labour government honours its previous undertakings to take back into public ownership the electricity generating industry and the British coal industry. Can, can, can we move on to, sorry, Mr, Mr. Morgan. An answer there I didn't, under, I didn't understand. I think it's an argument you've used twice. It's basically, I think you said that the power generators were building gas fired power stations in order to get around some controls. Could you expand on that? Yes, it's actually again in the in the subcommittee report that you produced. I, I'm sorry to, to bore you with that, but nevertheless, it is a fact. Um, what it what it is is that the privatisation uh, arrangements, when electricity um, was was privatised, um, placed restrictions on on the kind of increases that could be levied against the consumer. One way around that was that they could pass on um, increases that resulted from the generation of electricity. And it is a direct result of the increases in the generation of electricity that could be passed on. And uh, not necessarily in the one year or the two years, uh, but over a period of time, consumers will find themselves considerably worse off uh, than they would had they relied upon British deep mine coal. And if you look at the evidence that we gave in 1992, not only the predictions about pit closures have come true, but also the predictions about the number of gas-fired power stations have been proved to be absolutely true as well. 
when um, Mr. Budge was here a week, a week or so ago, he, he was saying that unless the government took some action in the short term, um, he was really confronted with two choices. Either um, pits would close because he wouldn't get the contracts with the generators, or he had to look for significant cost reductions, which really means imp on employment, employment cost reductions, and that would be the choice that was confronting him. And he, he, he specifically said that was not his d what he wanted, but that would be an alternative. I mean, are there, is there scope for further cost reductions in deep mine pits, do you think? No, the answer is not either of those two that Mr. Budge gave you. The answer is to take the pits back into public ownership. After all, if they're making over 200 million pounds a year profit, they're hardly uh, something that uh, would prove a burden for a new Labour government. But put yourself in Mr. Budge's position. <laughs> all right. Well, not in his particular position, but t take his company's position, which is a private, a private company, right? It's got to make a profit. If, you're conf if, you're, if you've got those two options ahead of you, closing more pits, making more people, putting more people out of work, or looking at your cost structure. You've got to look at your cost structure. Now, do you, I mean, well, perhaps I could rephrase it, because that's putting it maybe too bluntly. Right? Has, have working conditions for your members in the NUM declined since privatization? Yes. In what respect? We believe that the safety standards in our mining industry have deteriorated, and the fact that three colliery managers um, have uh, apparently been dismissed um, is a demonstration that there is something uh, fundamentally wrong in the industry as far as reporting accidents. Um, I have, for example, um, a branch official in this room today who has a member who has been threatened by colliery management that he faces disciplinary action and possibly dismissal if he continues to report accidents. That's hardly the way to treat one's workforce and hardly the way to get better uh, standards. The second thing I would say to you is this, that the industry on the privatization has seen the rapid introduction of what's known as a support system called roof bolting. Roof bolting instead of the steel arch girders. The difference is fundamental and in my view, um, one of the reasons why Ashford Colliery and Point of Air Colliery closed, because the system of support in my view is not sufficient to uh, support the mine correctly. It was designed because I was a member of the original team, uh, along with Labour ministers at the time, uh, that uh, planned out how Ashford would work in Leicestershire. And it was at all times on the basis that the pit would be supported by what we call steel arch girders, similar to the ones in the London Underground or in the Channel Tunnel. Uh, roof bolts are simply like a, a dinner plate with a steel rod through them um, holding up virtually nothing. I have no faith at all in roof bolts and have made my position absolutely clear at the time of the Billsthorpe public hearings. That's change because that they had that technology before privatisation. That's not something that Budge has brought in. That's continuing some technology that was there before, I think. Well, if you look again at uh, a report uh, by a select committee, you will see that both the former Chief Inspector of Mines and the select committee made a recommendation that roof bolts should not be used. The fact that they are being used, in my view, is a retrograde step. You've asked me a question about safety. I've given, my, given you my answer honestly. I believe that safety standards have deteriorated. And that's, in my view, an inevitable consequence of privatisation. What about paying conditions for your members? Again, it's difficult to um, give you an answer on this if for no other reason than the Minister um, will not, uh, either under the, the former Conservative government or even the present uh, new Labour government, give me the, the data that I need. I have repeatedly written uh, to both Mr Heseltine and then later to Margaret Beckett and ask for information so I can compare a like with like. The statistical data in the uh, survey which is produced, which shows the amount of average wages paid in the mining industry, was changed uh, some three years ago. And as a consequence, it makes it extremely difficult to compare the wages that were paid before and the wages that are being paid now. In addition, of course, there have been a number of mines closed so it's not, it's not a very easy question to answer. 
All I can do is to say that if I am supplied with the information that I have repeatedly asked for in writing uh, to both Conservative ministers and Labour ministers, it would be a lot easier to give you an answer. You can't know what your members are being paid, surely. I can't even get to know the number of people in individual unions because A, the owners refuse to give that information, and B, any information that we request uh, is being consistently blocked. And not only that, but when we write to the present ministers, uh, they too seem unable or unwilling to give us the information that we are asking for. I, don't, I find it extraordinary that if you take your own members of your own union, that you don't know what they're being, what they're, what they're being paid. The you problem, must, and I've tried to explain it, is that we can, look, we can look at the new earnings review survey, we can look at the statistical data, but it's impossible to gi give a fair comparison because the method of reproducing the figures has changed. Now, it's, it's something that Margaret Beckett has acknowledged to me in a reply, and it's something that the previous ministers, both Tim Egger and uh, Michael Heseltine, also uh, accepted. And so it is very difficult to do that. My own view is that if you look at what's happened over the period, that the level of wages of mine workers over the past few years has in real terms not improved whatsoever. Uh, if you look at the productivity that's taken place, that's the increase in productivity, uh, together with the trend in inflation, then miners' wages ought to be considerably higher than they are at the present time. We are currently being paid far more by way of uh, incentive payments and bonuses uh, to make up our wage than ever we were in the past. At one stage, it would be no more than about 23%. Now, it's more likely to be over half the wage that's made up in that uh, unstable way. Would it be right to say then, uh, if I can just um, draw a conclusion here, that you're not involved in wage negotiations and for the purposes of uh, the setting of the rates of pay, you're not recognised by management. Would that be correct? It would not only be correct, Mr Chairman, but above and beyond that, uh, since Mr Budge and other coal owners came uh, to own the industry, they have written and they have said that they will not have any negotiations with any trade union, and that includes BACM, that's the managers' union, and NACOBS, that's the under-officials' union, and the National Union of Mine Workers. Uh, they've even, I understand, written to their former friends in the UDM and told them that there is no conciliation scheme. Now, it is a little difficult uh, to get information from an employer who refuses to meet you, and an employer, incidentally, who refuses to meet us and discuss safety, although he gave an undertaking that he would do so and did so for a year and a half. What has been the consequences for your level of membership notwithstanding the closure. I mean, at one time the NUM was tall and intensive, well, uh, the coal industry was tall and intensive purposes a closed shop as far as um, men working in the extra extractive side and probably in Backham as well. Um, do you still have 100% membership in those collieries where you uh, are the dominant uh, union, if I can put it that way? In the absence of information from the employer, which we've repeatedly asked for and been denied, it's an impossible question to answer. All I can tell you is, on the basis of our own research, and that's all we can do, uh, we calculate that we have uh, approaching 90% of mine worker grades in our union. The one area that I cannot give you an answer about is outside contractors who literally uh, come in and out of the industry almost on a monthly basis. And that is more difficult to calculate. But by and large, in areas, for example, like Yorkshire, uh, there are no members of the UDM. They're all members of the National Union of Mine Workers. And a similar position obtains in Scotland and Wales. So how many members do you have then uh, on the basis of um, your own researches? On the basis of uh, our own research, the uh, figure that we had last year, and that's the only thing I can go on at the present time because we haven't got the calculations uh, currently. We're talking about working members, of course we are. We are uh, talking around 7,000 uh, mine workers compared with around 180,000 uh, in 1982 um, and 1983. Um, the same time when I appeared before the 
Trade and Industry Select Committee and warned that if something wasn't done, the coal mining industry could see the closure uh, of at least 95 pits leading to its decimation. And that's exactly what's happened. Mr. Max. A couple of more issues, but first on the, I want to come back to the environmental um, impact. Because I think one of the things that you've advocated, uh, Mr. Scargill, again, if I can refer to page 13 of, of, of your submission, and that was uh, that there was no need for gas-fired power stations. How would you answer the question about the impact, if, they, if that were to happen, if that were to be happen, and, and they were all to be uh, closed, the impact that that would have upon the economy of Scotland? Because from the information that I've, uh, I've got in front of me, there's something like, well, last year, something like 60,000 people. Uh, would some of them, their jobs would be in some jeopardy if there were to be a complete closure of, uh, of um, gas uh, CCGT uh, fire stations, um, power stations? My answer to your question would be that um, if the government of the day had listened to our arguments when there were no gas fire power stations, the number of people involved in generating electricity would be considerably higher than what it is today. Let me give you an example. To operate a gas-fired power station takes about 50 men, about that figure. To operate a coal-fired station, which is cheaper, needs around five, six, seven, eight hundred men. And so in any, in any consideration, one cares to make about the comparisons between the two generating processes. If you calculate the unemployment costs of displacing around 700 or 800 men from a coal-fired generated station to replace it with a gas-fired power station, which costs more to run. I'm saying my figures of, of 60,000 encompass far more than just the people operating uh, gas-fired uh, gas power stations, it, it, it encompasses within it some of the construction costs and obviously the extraction, the, the, the personnel involved in extraction, gas extraction as well. My figures actually uh, don't include that, but they will when I finish my answer. Um, if, you, if you calculate the figures, you can reasonably su suggest that in addition to the loss of, say, the 30,000 jobs that went in 1993-94, um, in that massive massacre uh, which took place under the Conservative government. For every job lost in the mining industry and for every job lost in a coal-fired generating power station, we believe, on the basis of evidence supplied uh, by people like uh, Andrew Glynn, Professor Glynn from Oxford University, that three jobs which are dependent either in terms of supplying to that industry or receiving from that industry are also, direct, are, are also affected. So it's by a factor of three, whatever the figure may be, and the, the fact that there are more people employed in mining by far than in gas means that for, far more people are affected as a direct consequence of closing mines and closing coal-fired power stations. Um, I, I concur with you, actually, in terms of the, uh, the figure that you've got, that the cost of coal is 1.6 pence per kilowatt hour, the, the, and I don't know whether you have the information, but part of the evidence that we took um, from the electricity uh, producers uh, was, of course, uh, what was happening, uh, part of the debate was what was happening with, uh, particularly, I think, a couple of fire stations, a couple of, why do I get fire stations, power stations, Drax and Ratcliffe, both of which have the fluid gas uh, desulfurisation costs inbuilt to them. And it, and it seemed, or the, certainly the information that, that I started to gain uh, from that discussion was that they were not, they're not base load stations, purely and simply because of the additional cost loaded onto uh, the cost of operating them as a result of the high cost of the, uh, the, 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 the FGD process. Uh, and if we were to move from um, gas-fired power stations purely onto coal, that would be an additional cost loaded onto the costs of electricity production at, 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 at such stations. And of course has moved on from the 1993 uh, Select Committee report because those, those costs are current. Any observations upon that at all? Or for that matter, do you have any information as to what the cost 
of uh, per, per kilowatt hour is from those stations kitted out with, uh, with uh, FGD? Yes, uh, I understand your question perfectly and uh, I think it's a, it's a fair question and it gives me an opportunity to give you um, a considered answer. The reality is that um, gas fired power stations can only operate with any degree of effectiveness or efficiency provided they're on base load. And so it's the very opposite of the point that you've been given by the power generators. If you operate a coal-fired station like Drax on base load and you operate a gas-fired power station uh, on base load, then there can be no doubt that the coal-fired power station has a tremendous cost advantage. But even at the worst case scenario, I would say that it's got at least a half pence to one pence uh, advantage over a gas-fired power station. And that's after fitting uh, flue gas desulfurization uh, units. Um, there can be no question in my mind anyway, that um, both in the evidence that has been previously given to the select committee, the evidence of the nuclear uh, power uh, producers, the evidence of the electricity generators themselves, by and large accept that if both stations are running on base load, that means continuously, then coal undoubtedly is the cheaper of the two. Can I just quick uh, switch direction? When we took, um, or we were, in advance was taking evidence from uh, RJB Mining, there had been some comments uh, made, I think, in the media, and I don't know where they came from, that if RJB were unable to satisfactorily conclude profitable contracts with the power generators, and it looked uh, that they were in the prospect of closing some of their, uh, their deep mine pits, that there's a company by the name of Midland Mining uh, who uh, came forward to say that they would look at buying those pits off RJB. I mean, have you got any observations upon that? And I don't know whether it was factual or, or not. It, was, uh, it, was, it might just have been media speculation. Have you got any comments on whether you would, happy, whether you would be happy to, uh, uh, to see that taking place? Um, and again, it comes back to the earlier question, and I appreciate you may have some difficulty in answering it, about the pay and conditions involved uh, with Midland Mining as a company, if you've got any knowledge of that. To quote a, a very famous former Labour minister called Aniram Bevan, I, like him, detest privatisation. And I am not in favour of either RJB Mining or Midlands Mining or any of the other private companies owning Britain's deep mine uh, coal industry. I am in favour, as was the Labour Party, of Britain's mining industry being publicly owned. We fought for that for years and we will not depart from that objective. If that is not going to happen, it's been stated clearly to you that that is not uh, going to happen, that then there are, there are a number of prospects. I mean, um, if RJB conclude their contracts, then they've obviously got continuity of, 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 of production and they will continue to operate as a company, presumably. If they can't satisfactorily um, conclude those contracts uh, on, on a profitable basis to them as a company, they've said that they will close some of uh, maybe five, six um, of, the, uh, of, of the deep mines. Uh, and Midland are saying that they, or it's alleged Midland are saying that they would take over those pits. I mean, would it not be better uh, to see, uh, irrespective of the ownership, those, those pits remaining open rather than to, to see them closed? I'm not going to change my position on this. And let me put this to you. If they're going to close those mines, what's the difficulty in the Labour government taking them over, particularly when we have proved beyond any shadow of a doubt that they're efficient, economic, with hundreds of years of reserves within them. And I would advise this committee very strongly to look at the actual reserves in the reports that have been presented by a former energy minister called Tony Benn, because the reserves that I'm talking about are both those which are currently within the five or 10 year or 15 or 20 year plan. Uh, but there are many more reserves which are, uh, at the present time have not even been taken into account. I'll give you one example because I think it's worth it. In the reports given to the Select Committee in 1992 and 1993, it was suggested that the Prince of Wales colliery had only got about eight years life. 
um, under RJB Mining, they've opened up reserves, which I think have got about 35 years already. And that was in line with what we were talking about. In fact, we were talking about even more than that. The fact is that there are over a thousand years of coal reserves in Britain, both known and uh, as yet, um, what we would call not mapped out, not um, taken into account, but they're there. And so that if there are coal mines which are going to be closed, either by RJB Mining or anyone else, our argument, very powerfully to this committee, that it is that it ought to be recommending uh, to the government that they should be taken back into public ownership because the, the, the choice is a simple one. You allow them to die because they've been privatised and you opposed it uh, as a government, and I'm saying this is what the committee should be saying to the government, uh, and here's an opportunity to take them back into public ownership or allow them to close. Now, I prefer mines to be taken back into public ownership anyway, but certainly, if they're going to be threatened with closure, there can be no doubt that the economic argument becomes all-powerful because it costs £10,000 a year to keep someone unemployed, and it must be better uh, to take them into public ownership rather than start paying out unemployment benefit. Could, it, could we just touch on one area that we haven't really gone into, and I think this will be the last one today, Mr Scarborough, because I think we've covered virtually everything. Um, can we just get your views on the question of uh, emissions? Uh, as you know, the other story, apart from your appearance here today, is Kyoto, uh, or one of the stories anyway, let's put it like that. Um, now, part of the debate has moved on quite considerably since 1992-93. Um, the tolerance of emissions is now far less than once it was. And so we have a situation where it is assumed that coal is a dirty fuel in terms of emissions. Um, what would you have to say about that? What I would say is what I said right at the beginning, that it's a, an argument that seeks to mislead and deceive the British people. If the argument was sustainable, then why is it that we are importing 20 million tonnes of dirty fuel? And why is it that we're producing 16 million tonnes of open cast coal, which not only has the same effect as deep mine coal, but far more important, is a pollutant at the very point where it's extracted? That's 36 million tonnes of coal. No one seems to question that that's needed. Now, if we require 36 million tonnes of coal from coal imports and from open cast mining, then I submit that you should be recommending that that coal ought to be provided by Britain's deep mine uh, coal industry, which is certainly more environmentally acceptable than open cast mining, far more economic than coal imports because it saves a billion pound on your balance of payments, and at the end of the day saves a great number of jobs which would be threatened. So on every consideration, it must be to the advantage of the nation and to the environment to use British deep mine coal. And with clean coal technology, we estimate that... Uh, but Working in any coal-fired in coal power station in the United Kingdom. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, with respect, the clean coal technology does exist. It has previously been recommended both by... Uh, select committees and by the NUM over many years that the clean coal technology should be fitted all over. But you will be aware, no doubt, that uh, emissions uh, towards the greenhouse effect um, are increasingly um, apparent from gas fire stations because there are more of them, yep. and reducing be from coal fire stations because they're re going down. But if you're serious about the environment, as a new Labour government I'm talking about, then uh, you ought to be looking at the real pollutant in this country. The biggest pollutant by a mile is the heavy haulage road transport system, which is polluting the atmosphere to a, a tremendous extent. And if we were to tackle that by putting the heavy freight back onto the rail, then we would be really doing something positive. And that's the real answer, not by closing down Britain's remaining uh, 22 well, coal mines. I, I think that there's a a view that there are a variety of means of contributing to a reduction in emissions. 
Um, I, I'm just, you know, you've made the point, which I certainly would sign up to, that um, there is, it, it is wrong to suggest that gas-fired stations are clean. The only kind of station which doesn't give any emissions, it may have other problems, but the only kind of station which doesn't have emissions of an unacceptable character into the atmosphere is nuclear. That's the one that killed over 100,000 people at Chernobyl, isn't it? Well, that is perhaps, it has been suggested that it's like comparing a ladder with probably the kind of car that you or I drive. Um, and I don't think that it's necessarily analogous. And that kind of scaremongering is not very helpful to the people who, for no fault of their own, live next to nuclear power stations in the United Kingdom. Uh, but I, all I would say to you is that there is an argument advanced that if you wish to have a, 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 a reduction from energy generation in uh, emissions, then you need, to have the, the, you need to have nuclear power to give elbow room, as it were, to the other fuels which do have emissions and will have emissions for some time to come, given the fact that, as yet, there isn't a, a particularly cheap or cost-effective means of generating a coal by clean te technologies. Well, let me assure you, uh, Mr Chairman, that uh, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful by quoting Chernobyl. I could have quoted Three Mile Island, but I'll... No one died at Three Mile Island. Uh, to your knowledge. Well, I, don't, I, I think the Americans are rather um, good at counting their dead in these kind of circumstances. Well, as, as someone who acted as an advocate in three public inquiries into the nuclear industry, I can tell you that people have died as a result of the windscale disaster in 1957, and that's not in the Ukraine. That happens to be in Cumbria. And the fact that we've now got ten times the level of cancers and leukemias in the areas in or around our nuclear power stations, something no doubt... Uh, the people from the nuclear industry would dispute, but nevertheless, doctors and uh, those in the medical world would not, is an overwhelming reason why you shouldn't use it. It's a pollutant that we should not be tolerating in this day and age, and it's one of the reasons why uh, practically every country in the world, apart from France, are closing down their nuclear power industry. And certainly, as you know, uh, places like Sweden have said, uh, we're closing the, the whole nuclear power industry down. But if you want an economic reason, I think I've already given you one. It's costing around eight pence per kilowatt hour to produce electricity from nuclear energy. It's costing 1.6 pence per kilowatt hour to produce electricity from coal. And if you do fit the clean coal technology, in our view, it will still be no more than about 1.9 pence per kilowatt hour. I can think of no more compelling argument to keep Britain's minds open. I mean, it has been suggested that a nuclear power station is more dangerous when it's not running than when it is, when its, li its useful life has still some time to go. Uh, now, that's an argument we can lay on the table, but it is one that I think has, uh, 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 we have to take account of. Now, just this last point I'd like to clear up. Um, it's been suggested that your opposition to open cast is a historical opposition, which comes from the fact that the people who work in open cast mining are not your members. And that uh, that's the reason why you're op opposed to open cast, despite the fact that in some coal companies' accounting arrangements, there is a direct subsidy from open cast to deep mining. What would you say to that? I would say it's absolute nonsense. My opposition to open cast mining happens to be in line with your previous question. It's an environmental consideration. Open cast mining not only scars the countryside, despoils the area and destroys many parts, many areas of our beautiful land. But it also uh, contributes uh, to polluting the very environment that we've been discussing at the point of production. You can't, for example, in the area that's going to be developed near Mr. Battle's constituency, uh, open up 36 acres of land, destroying all the wildlife that exists in that area, uh, and then hope that it's not going to have some terrible uh, adverse effect upon the environment. But in addition, the coal that they're using uh, goes to a power station in the main. That coal can be supplied from Britain's deep mine uh, coal industry without scarring our countryside, without despoiling our environment. And I think as an environmentalist all my life, I am entitled 
to argue that consistency uh, has been one of my hallmarks on this question. Yeah. Mr Scarlow, could you maybe assist me then? What should I have said to my constituents who are NUM members who were asking me to make representations to Fife Council in order that an open cast mine be developed in Fife in order to help uh, what they consider to be the plight of people at Long Gannet, who are my constituents working in the mine there and my constituents working uh, in large measure in the, 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 uh, the coal-fired power station. Now that was your members in an official capacity lobbying me to support open cast mining because they saw it as a means of sweetening the coal that was going into the, 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 the power station and secondly of reducing the cost of the coal because the coals were owned both by the same company, Mining Scotland. I think you should have said to them uh, three things. One, that they're wrong. Two, they're speaking against NUM policy. And three, what they're advocating is neither necessary or advantageous not, uh, to the environment or to the coal mining industry. We do not accept that you need to sweeten uh, coal, which is deep mined, by open cast mining. And we've proved that time and time again. It is an argument that's put forward by the producers of open cast coal, but it is not one that is sustainable if one examines it in detail. And therefore, we reject completely uh, the open cast mining argument because it simply has no place in any civilized society that really says that it's committed to cleaning up the environment. You can't clean up the environment on the one hand and continue to have open cast mining on the other. And you certainly can't argue to close down Britain's deep mine uh, coal pits, which there are 22 left, at the same time as we import uh, 20 million tonnes of coal from abroad, which in uh, every case, according to Margaret Beckett, uh, is being heavily, heavily subsidised or produced by near slave labour. Well, all I can say is that uh, there seems to be a lack of consistency in the ranks of the NUM on this issue as far as the Scottish region is concerned. But, of course, I realise that you're a, conf a federated organisation so that uh, there is a degree of uh, uh, freedom afforded to the, the various areas, as I understand, uh, over time. The, Scot the Scotland area is not a federated structure any longer. It's part of the NUM. And if you want evidence for that, look at well, the Certification Officer's annual report. OK, well, anyway, they're obviously... Um, not following the line, but that's something that you might have to pursue. But as I say, I just raised it as a constituency point because uh, it was uh, a number of us were lobbied quite mm. strongly by your members on that. But look, I, I think I just wanted to raise that because I can abuse the position of chairman now and again. Uh, but can I thank you for the responses you've given us today? They've been extremely helpful. Uh, you've covered a lot of ground. Um, I, I think that we've uh, got a clear picture of what your part of the industry. Uh, now it feels as uh, the priorities of the industry, whether that will be shared by my colleagues or, for that matter, the government who will have to respond to our report remains to be seen. But I should say to you that this is going to be at the first stage, and there might be a two-stage uh, consideration of energy. And we, we wanted to look at what was a critical situation in relation to coal, uh, and that's why we were so anxious to have you uh, as soon as possible. Um, but we are, after the year, going to be casting our net rather wider and looking at, you might say, the fuel mix within the United Kingdom, uh, not exclusively through the perspective of coal. And we'll be issuing uh, invitations to give evidence. And in this wider position, you may well be interested in uh, providing us with additional information uh, as, as time goes on. And it may be that some of the points that you've raised today will have to come back to you on, or it may be that we're in a position to require the kind of answers that you've been unable to obtain elsewhere uh, and get them onto the public record in a form that is intelligible to, um, to, to everyone who's got an interest in these matters. So thanks very much for coming along. Could you say, Jim, because I think it's important. Um, thank you for listening to my uh, evidence. Um, I would say, from my point of view, it's been useful. And if the committee at least look back on the evidence given by the NUM over the years, it will see that, that it's not only been consistent, but being proved correct. And secondly, we are in favour of an integrated energy policy based upon clean coal technology and renewable energy sources such as wind, wave, tide, geothermal and solar energy. So we are 
environmentalists as well as coal producers. Thanks so much, Mr.